All right. Uh, welcome everybody to the first uh, uh, DDD here, here seminar of the semester. I'm the new academic year. So before Nathan's, uh, Nathan starts talking, let me mention a few organizational things. So this uh, semester we are trying a somewhat different schedule where the Tuesday talks will be at, at noon and the Thursday talks will be at one. And also for logistical reasons having to do with the setting up of the video equipment, the lunch, I mean, so, The, the main lunch will be on Tuesdays at 1, and it will be after the seminar as opposed to before. So uh, I will explain all these things again sort of in more detail in the email that you'll be getting for the seminar. And by the way, if you are not on the DGD gear mailing list and would like the gist of this, send me an email and I'll let you so you will get uh, regular emails about this. Um, as an extra enticement to students, both graded and undergraded, for going to attend these lunches, you know, so the days when we have an external speaker, the students eat for free. You know, the days when we don't have an external speaker, the students pay five dollars for lunch. So it's a good incentive for you. And that, with that being said, so now Nathan Dunfell is going to give his talk, and he's going to regale us with a tale of two norths. Regale, okay, <laughs> uh, a high standard now. I have to meet for the first uh, talk of of the semester. Uh, so, so I want to tell you about some work today, mostly joint with, with Jeff Brock, a, a portion which I'll indicate joint with uh, Anil Harani. Um, and the, what the objects that I'll be looking at in this talk are uh, three manifolds, uh, in particular hyperbolic three manifolds. So I'm going to be interested in closed, so that just means compact and no boundary, orientable, uh, hyperbolic, Three manifolds. Um, so hyperbolic means that it has a Ramanian metric of constant sectional curvature minus one. Uh, or another way of saying this is going to be the quotient of the three-dimensional hyperbolic space, which is the unit ball in R3 with some funny metric, uh, modulo uh, discrete group of isometries of that. So since this is the first talk of, of the semester, maybe I will um, say a little bit more uh, about why uh, focusing on hyperbolic uh, three manifolds is a, a reasonable thing to do. I mean, hyperbolic geometry in any dimension, I think, is something that's very interesting. But um, there's a reason that it's particularly crucial in dimension three. Um, and that is uh, Thurston's mantra that in dimension three, and only dimension three, uh, topology uh, is equal to geometry. Um, and by, by this geometry, what I mean here is really the geometry, a uh, homogeneous geometry. Things like Euclidean, um, uh, Euclidean manifolds or, or spherical manifolds, things like this. Turns out there are eight geometries in three dimensions. That's not what's not important. Uh, what is important is that. Um, Perlman proved Thurston's geometrization conjecture, which says if I just hand you a closed orientable three manifold, you can cut it into pieces. How this works is not, not important for this talk, but you can cut it into pieces, each of which emits a geometric structure, something like a metric of constant curvature or some kind of close related item. Um, and so this is a very powerful structure theorem. If you are, are uh, maybe this is where I personally came from, interested solely in the topology of, of three manifolds, you can use the existence of these special, very homogeneous, very nice metrics to try to study the topology. And much of what we know about three manifolds, why, for example, the fundamental groups are so special, a lot of that comes from the existence of these geometries. But it's not just that, the, that you have the geometry. Um, there are, as I said, eight of these geometries, and the most common of which is the hyperbolic geometry constant curvature minus one. Um, and this is both the most common in the boat mo and the most mysterious. So we do not have um, a complete understanding by any uh, means of sort of, of hyperbolic three manifolds. Manifolds that admit the other seven geometries, those actually are, are, are classified in a, in, in a very reasonable sense. Um, so the hyperbolic manifolds are the ones I'm going to focus on because they're the generic and the interesting case. But it's not just that the interesting three manifolds, in some sense, have these hyperbolic metrics. 
Uh, a theorem of Mostow says that when you're in dimensions more than two, if you have a hyperbolic metric, then it's unique. Um, so if I write down any topological description of a three-manifold, for example, I take the three-sphere and I remove that embedded circle, it's called the figure eight knot, uh, this turns out to be a hyperbolic manifold. It's not compact, but it has finite volume. And what Moss now says is that the volume, the, is that that hyperbolic metric is unique. So the volume of that hyperbolic structure is actually just an invariant of the topology of, of this knot. 2.02988 something something. Uh, and so uh, what this talk explores is an aspect of something that um, is the focus of a lot of of three-dimensional topology, which is to better understand, I mean, I drew this picture. There is a hyperbolic metric. Um, you can figure out what it is. You can compute things like the volume. But how do various topological features of the manifold relate to geometric features and conversely? Um, and the story I want to tell you today is one, one concrete aspect of that. All right, and so um, the story I want to tell you today is about um, two different notions of complexity of cohomology classes for one of these hyperbolic three manifolds. So let me just, to start, just tell you very briefly uh, what these two things are, but then I'll actually spend the first half of the talk telling you what they are in, in more, more detail. This is just to sort of give you some framework for what I'd like to say. So start off. Uh, with a cohomology class, one-dimensional cohomology class, or Poincaré Dooley, we can think about that uh, as a second homology class. And at this stage in my career, in fact, I can't tell these groups apart. Um, and so the, the first way I'd like to talk about the complexity of such a thing is something called the Thurston norm. And so this is going to be something that's purely topological. Will make sense whether your manifold is hyperbolic or not. Um, I'm just going to focus on roughly what the Thurston norm is. It's the uh, minimal genus. If so if you think about things in terms of homology, um, there, we're thinking about a two-dimensional homology class. Because we're in co-dimension one, um, that homology class can be represented by a nice embedded surface. Of course, there'll be lots of different surfaces that represent that same class. Um, and I'm going to say the complexity of that class is the topology of the simplest such surface, which represents it. So it's the minimal genus, let's say, um, of uh, the simplest surface. Well, minimal, I guess I already has. Uh, the minimal genus of any surface, uh, which is S dual, Poincaré dual, to that. So something like this relates back to um, very classical questions in topology, like if you have a knot in the three-sphere, it's always the boundary of some surface. You can ask what's the simplest, what's the smallest genus surface? So in particular, like this figure eight knot happens to bound a surface of genus one. Okay, so that's the Thurston norm. And again, I'll, I'll say more about it. But that doesn't, I should say, I'll, you should also still feel free to interrupt me at any moment. Um, and the second norm is something called the harmonic norm. So in this case, we'll focus on this thing as an actual cohomology class. And I want to think about it as being represented by some smooth one form on the manifold. Um, and when you prove the Hodge theorem, there's a notion of the, an inner product that's introduced on forms, which I'll, I'll describe in, in detail in a moment. Um, and it gives you a, an inner product on forms. And then you can do something like, say, take the one form representing this of least norm with respect to this sort of L2 inner product. Um, so this is, you're looking at sort of L2 minimal representatives of the cohomology classes, um, and then just taking their, their L2 norm. So this is something which is defined, uh, the, this L2 inner product, it involves intimately the metric of the manifold, as I will describe. Um, and so this is the thing that depends very much on the geometry. The preferred representatives, the so-called harmonic representatives, 
are things which are in the kernel of um, the Laplace operator on forms. So some kind of solutions to some kind of PDE that involves the metric. But uh, OK, so this is, these are two things, one topological, one geometric. Um, and the beautiful theorem of uh, some number theorists, Bergeron, uh, Sengen, uh, and Venkatesh last year uh, is that, in fact, these two norms are closely related. Uh, and the work I want to tell you about today with Jeff Brock is a refinement of their results, um, which uh, show more precisely exactly how uh, these two norms um, are, are related. So are uh, the questions so far? No, I'm always thinking of a closed manifold here. Yeah, the example was not was not compact. Yeah, I mean maybe maybe just that's a good. From now on, we have a convention, uh, which is that all manifolds are closed, uh, and also uh, let's make them not just orientable but oriented. Yeah, the thing is that it's actually harder to draw a picture of a uh, closed hyperbolic manifold than it is of a non-compact but finite volume one. And that's why I drew that. But you're right, that doesn't fit into the, quite into the context of which I was speaking. OK, so um, I think maybe uh, for this audience, I'd like to start off with uh, talking more about the harmonic norm first, because I think that's probably unfamiliar to most people. Some of you work with things like the Thurston norm. So the context is we have our uh, closed hyperbolic three manifold, they're just Ramanian three manifold. Um, and the harmonic norm comes from an inner product initially not on cohomology classes, but on one forms. So if I take two uh, smooth one forms on my manifold, you define their inner product as the integral over the manifold of, you take alpha, you wedge it with the Hodge star of beta, so the Hodge star is something that takes forms of one dimension and flips them into forms of complementary dimensions. Um, so in particular, star beta is going to be a two form. So a one form wedge of two form is a three form, and that's something you can reasonably integrate over a three manifold, and you'll get a number. But this identification of forms of dimension one with the forms of dimension two, it really depends on the metric. Um, and so I guess I should say this is a symmetric, um, positive, definite, bilinear form on uh, one forms. Um, and maybe here's actually, let me actually say how I like to think about this. Uh, Somehow the Hodge star is maybe a little formal if you're not used to it. Certainly, I don't really like it. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the norm of a class, so just, uh, you know, of course, the square root of the inner product of, of alpha with itself, uh, you can write this in the following way. It's equivalent to this, but uh, maybe this will show where the metric comes in more, more naturally. So we're going to integrate a function over the manifold with respect to volume, the points p in the manifold. And the function we're going to integrate is at every point, uh, we can look at alpha, right, which is a one form, a one form at some point. In other words, it's a linear functional from the tangent space of the manifold at that point to r. Um, and as such, it has a, an operator norm. You can ask. How much does it stretch the length of a non-zero vector? So that's the, my notation for the operator norm. And this is supposed to be an L2 thing, so I'm going to square it. And I should not forget my square root. Uh, another way of thinking of this is um, right, we can use the metric, if we like, to, to 
um, identify a one form with a vector field on the manifold, where computing the one form of a vector is you take the inner product with your vector field. Um, and so this is just, so if we just think about this as a vector field, uh, we're just taking the length squared of the vector field at this point, and we're integrating that, that function over the manifold and getting a number. So that's the um, norm on forms. But it's not a norm on cohomology classes. Each cohomology class has many different representatives, um, and they will have different uh, L2 norms. So to extend this to a norm on uh, cohomology, I'm going to define, um, or there's going to be a particular representative of a cohomology class which we really like. So it's called the harmonic representative alpha of some cohomology class. You can allow it to have, let's say, real coefficients, uh, is the unique representative of minimal L2 norm. In that class. It's a unique representative of this, which has minimal norm. Of course, it's not obvious that such a thing exists or is unique. That's the, con that's the content of, of the Hodge theorem. Um, another way of saying this is that um, alpha is the representative, which is in the kernel. of the Laplacian on one form. So this is decomposed with, so D is the usual exterior Durand derivative. This is its formal adjoint plus D star composed with D. So it's the solution to some uh, elliptic PD. Um, so that's the definition of the harmonic representative. Um, and then from this, we'll just define the L2 norm of phi to be the L2 norm of the harmonic representative. Um, and the fact that these are, are all things which live in the kernel here means if you take two harmonic forms and add them, you get something that's harmonic. And that means that, in fact, this thing here defined on the level of cohomology will still be a norm. It's really the, the, inside the space of all one forms, you have a finite dimensional subspace of harmonic one forms. And you're just restricting this norm to that finite dimensional subspace. Uh, so to provide a little more, uh, other questions? A little more uh, intuition about this. After all, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. A thousand words take some time to stay, even if you speak at my usual rate. Let me show you some work that I've been doing with uh, Neil Harani here uh, to actually try to compute uh, this harmonic norm. Um, so far, we haven't managed to do it for any three manifolds, but we are able to do it for uh, surfaces. I mean, everything I've said so far is not really dependent on the dimension. You, manifold here could be any dimension. Um, and uh, so let me just show you um, what some of these harmonic forms look like to give you some intuition. Um, so, the, so instead of a three manifold, I'm going to be looking at a hyperbolic surface. Um, and uh, the hyperbolic surface actually is going to be an orbifold. There'll be one point uh, where the metric has a singularity. So it's actually going to be a torus with one uh, cone point where the angle around it is only pi as opposed to 2 pi. That's just, that's just so I can make the example small enough so we can get it on the screen easily. Um, so the, uh, geometrically, what this uh, surface S here is, is you take this quadrilateral in hyperbolic space. So this is sitting inside the Poincaré model, uh, the unit, open unit disk in the complex plane. It has the usual. Uh, Romanian metric on there, so angles match Euclidean, but there's some distortion, so objects that are close to the boundary are much, much larger than they actually appear. Um, and so you take this quadrilateral, 
Uh, and it turns out that um, this side and this side are the same length, and this side and this side are also the same length. Uh, so you can glue them together. And it turns out the total interior angle here is pi. So we're identifying this side to this side uh, by a translation like this, this side to this side by a hyperbolic translation like that. Um, and that builds us a torus with, because the angle around this vertex is only pi, this singularity. Um, and then in addition, so you know, in the Poincaré model, right, uh, g at e6, they're circles which meet the boundary at right angles. Uh, where a straight line is, is a circle, and a straight line is the only meet the boundary at right angles if they happen to go right through the origin. So this red line here and this blue line here, those are actually geodesics. Um, and the identification of this with this is such that this endpoint is glued to this endpoint. So this blue curve actually wraps up to become uh, this closed geodesic here on the torus, and um, this red geodesic here becomes this red guy there. Um, and I'm going to call those uh, two curves, I'm going to call the red one A and the blue one B. Other questions? Okay, so let's look at first at, um, so, uh, uh, so I haven't, alpha is going to be the Poincaré dual of A. So A is this loop here, right, these sides are glued, it's this red loop. Um, and the Poincaré dual thing, the Poincaré dual thing is the thing that when you integrate it over another loop, it's the same as counting intersections with um, the red thing. So in the, like the proof of Poincaré duality, right, if you, if you want to do the Poincaré dual of A, what you would do normally is you take a little neighborhood of A, and you take a little one form that's supported in that neighborhood, so that if you cross that neighborhood and integrate, along any path, you get one. Um, and that way, if you take any loop, maybe it goes around some number of times before closing up, then uh, integrating that form just counts the number of intersections with this guy. Right. Now, that's a perfectly good form that I just described. It would live totally in a little neighborhood. Um, and as I was still saying, you can always think of one forms uh, du dually as, as vector fields. Um, and so that's what I've drawn here. So this alpha, uh, that's the Poincaré dual of A, and actually alpha, I guess, my notation is not quite consistent, uh, this is, is the harmonic representative. So this is the harmonic representative of the Poincaré dual of A, which means that if I take a path that goes once around the torus, intersects this guy once, and I integrate my one form along that path, I'm going to get exactly one. Um, and also, if I integrate along this path, which doesn't intersect itself, um, then, well, you can see these guys are basically all at right angles, so it's going to integrate around to get zero. Um, but what you've noticed is that instead of being concentrated in a small neighborhood of A, like in the proof of point curve duality, um, the forms spread out, right? Along like this line here, where it has to integrate to one, it's roughly the same um, size uh, everywhere. Um, and that's because, I mean, this is maybe, uh, in some sense this is, this is why it works. So the point is, the analogous question, somehow, if you wanted to think about just functions on an interval, is to say you represent a particular class, it's like saying you have to integrate to 1 as you go around. That's like you're saying, I want a function on the interval whose L1 norm is 1. Right? So there's, of course, lots of ways I could do that, one of which would be to take just a function whose constant is 1, constant height 1. Another thing I could do is, like in the proof of Poincaré duality, I could concentrate um, that fixed amount of area over a much smaller base. Like maybe this is one tenth because the vertical height is ten. So these have the same L1 norm. L1 norm of both of them is one, but the L2 norm, like this one is one. And this one is the square root of 10. Um, and so since the harmonic guy wants to minimize its L2 norm, it's not going to do something like this. It's going to spread out uh, as, as much as possible. Other questions? So this is beta, which by definition is the Poincaré dual of this other 
curve B. Um, so in this case, if I take a curve that runs across like this and integrate it, I'll get one. Um, now, these vectors are shorter than the other vectors because this direction is longer, you see. So if you're going to integrate something to get one, the vectors are going to be shorter. Um, and this also has a, a slightly different feature than the other one, is that you'll notice that the arrows are actually getting shorter as you move away from this GDC. And that's because the, the desire of the L2 norm to spread out um, is interacting with a, one of the key things about hyperbolic space, which is in hyperbolic space, as you move away from a point, things expand exponentially. So remember, this metric is distorted. So this thing here, um, it, this, this side here is definitely longer to us than this, but actually in hyperbolic space, it's, notice, it's, it's a lot more longer than that. Um, and so if this thing tried to be sort of uniform the whole way, it would have to ha be sort of, there'd be a lot of area here where the vectors were the same length as here. And that, the fact there's more area here than here discourages that. So there is also some sense in which it does try to concentrate near the geodesic that it's dual to. Oh, so then just to compare them, I have one little plot here uh, where you can see uh, the, two got the two things on the same plot. So here's uh, beta and here's alpha in red. Um, this norm, right, it came from an inner product. Uh, so we can say, well, what's the inner product of alpha and beta? Um, and it turns out to be, I guess, sorry, I didn't even tell you the numbers on the last ones. All right, so it turns out that the L2 norm of alpha is this number. I mean, this is what Anil and I have been doing, is figuring out numerical methods to uh, compute these numbers. Um, the uh, L2 norm of beta is much smaller, corresponding to the fact that these vectors are a lot shorter. Uh, and then, if we like, we can also take the inner product between alpha and beta, and we'll get a number. Um, and then, okay, so then this is a picture here. Uh, this is the cohomology of this orbifold S, right? It's just a copy of R2. It's the torus. Um, and inside here, we can look at uh, the unit ball, the region where the L2 norm is less than 1, right? I mean, the L2 norm, it just comes from some inner product. It's defined in this complicated way, but it's just an inner product. And so um, the unit ball in this norm is just an ellipse. And it turns out when you take the numbers that you had, that alpha, you see, has much bigger norm than beta, which means that the point where this intersects is smaller because this has norm 1 and this has norm 1. And the fact that this is positive is what's tilting this guy to this direction, but that's a concrete picture of a, um, what these harmonic forms look like. Yes, absolutely. So, so he, the question is, why did I pick this particular one? Um, yeah, so actually there's a, a two real parameter family of such guys, um, and uh, they're specified by a pair of angles. And um, I chose this one uh, just because it, the two forms looked somewhat different than each other um, and had somewhat different behaviors. But um, in fact, we've computed it for any number of different, uh, different examples. Uh, what are their lengths? That I do not remember offhand. Uh, but they're on the order of, I think they're on the order of two, one to two. Uh, other questions? Okay, well that was that for the pictures. So that's uh, the harmonic norm represent coming from these vector fields that are sort of trying to relax, spread out, unlike the start of term. Let me now uh, say what the Thurston norm is and then state our result. Um, so the Thurston norm. So here we start off with some, let's say, integral initially cohomology class. Um, the Thurston norm of this guy um, is, by definition, so I said it's basically the genus of the simplest surface, but to make this a norm, I want to look not at the genus, but minus the Euler characteristic. 
right? So assuming S is connected, this is two, just 2G two minus 2. G is the genus. Um, and we're going to take the minimum. It's supposed to be the simplest. So we want to minimize 2G minus 2 over all representatives. S is dual. to uh, the cohomology class B. And I need to add a little uh, caveat and uh, no component of S is a two-sphere. Um, and the reason that's there is if I had some surface uh, which is dual to phi, I could always take inside a little ball, a little S2, and add that to my surface. Since that two-sphere bounds a ball, I haven't changed the homology class. But on the other hand, and I've increased the Euler characteristic by 2, which means I've decreased minus the Euler characteristic by minus 2. So if I didn't exclude these things, then the Thurston norm of every class would be minus infinity. And it was just because you were just adding on these two stupid two spheres. And I guess I could also say that every component of S uh, is homologically non-trivial. You just don't, you don't want to put like, extra stuff you don't need. So that's the definition. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, simple geometric arguments show that this actually, this function on cohomology, it's actually uh, subadditive and linear on rays. So it gives you a sort of norm, uh, maybe semi norm, on um, this integer lattice. And uh, in fact, it extends. Uh, continuously to um, the real cohomology. Um, and uh, the unit ball in this norm uh, turns out to be a finite sided convex polytope. And all of this, I mean, this is a purely topological notion. This makes sense for any uh, three manifold. Um, one place that we'll use that our manifold is hyperbolic uh, is that that turns out to force this norm to be non degenerate. So for any non-zero class, um, the Thurston norm is positive. That's because in a hyperbolic manifold, there are essentially the only way you can have your norm be zero is if your cohomology class is represented by a torus. Um, and there are no interesting tori uh, in a hyperbolic manifold for the same reason that a word hyperbolic group contains no z plus z's. OK, so um, it extends to this nice norm. It's rational polytope. I mean, you have to prove all these things, but really really not that hard in the end. Um, so then the picture we have motivate the results. All right, so the picture we have is we have our closed hyperbolic three manifold. And we look at its cohomology. And we have these two norms on the cohomology. On the one hand, we have the uh, Thurston norm. Um, so the unit ball in the Thurston norm is just going to be some uh, polygon, symmetric polygon, with rational vertices. Maybe it's this hexagon. And then it also has this other norm coming from its geometry, the harmonic norm. Uh, that came from an inner product. So it's uh, Unit ball is going to be an ellipse. And let me reiterate that while this thing is defined in terms of the metric, Mostow rigidity says that hyperbolic metric is unique. So in the end, the topology actually determines both the thing that's obviously purely topological um, and the thing which a priori seems geometric. And so the question that 
Bergeron, Singer, and Venkatesh asked was, well, what's the relationship between these two norms? I mean, is, for example, the Thurston norm ball always contained inside, or do they differ up to some uh, sort of uniform scale factor? Uh, and I mean, they were interested in this because of questions about torsion growth and uh, arithmetic groups and things like L2 Betty numbers, uh, Ray Singer torsion. That's all a very beautiful story, but not one that I'm going to tell you today. Um, I'm just going to tell you uh, how these things are related. So the main result that Jeff and I have generalizing their work is that for all uh, closed hyperbolic three manifolds, one has the following relationship between these norms. So the harmonic norm is bounded from below by the Thurston norm times a constant uh, which depends on the geometry of the manifold. So the universal constant of pi, and then you divide by the square root of the volume of m. Um, and similarly, it's bounded above by some constant times the Thurston norm, where again, um, this uh, constant depends on the geometry of the manifold, not its volume, but its injectivity radius. So let's say one has on where here I have to tell you what the injectivity radius is. Um, the injectivity radius, maybe the simplest way of saying it is it's uh, half the length of the shortest closed geodesic. Um, or equivalently, it's the largest radius so that if I take any point in my manifold and I look at the metric ball of that radius, open ball of that radius about that point, that's isometric to the corresponding ball in hyperbolic space. So that's a... Oh, yes, so, so, yes, so, um, let me put that up over here. So their result um, was that uh, there exist constants C1, C2, depending on whoop, uh, the injectivity radius of M such that uh, the L2 norm is bounded below by this. So bounded above by this and bounded below by C1 over the volume of M. Um, so the, the improvements are that uh, this factor here is not the volume, but it's the square root of the volume, and that the constants are uh, not just implicit functions of the injectivity radius, they're explicit functions, and the constants themselves are explicit. But I mean, this is really the fundamental contribution just refining it. Ah, so uh, the question is how sharp? So um, for example, there are infinite families of, so I guess, you know, you need to talk about like you have a pair, a manifold, and a cohomology class. So there are infinitely many pairs, manifold, cohomology class, so that uh, this thing is essentially sharp. Um, and if the injectivity radius is bounded below, there are also examples where this thing is sharp. When the injectivity radius is very small, I do not believe this is the correct estimate. Uh, when the injectivity radius is small, I think this should not be uh, the square root of the injectivity radius, but some much smaller quantity, like log of it or something, or log of one over it. So yeah, we definitely do have some results indicating that, that these results are reasonably good but uh, definitely not 
in the case of the one on the right optimal. Are there questions? You should think of them. You should think of them. Uh, you could think of them as being uh, uh, independent of one another. So, uh, the, right, the the injectivity radius is the size of the length of the shortest geodesic. So, if I draw a picture in two dimensions, like in this picture, the injectivity radius is controlled by this um, curve here because it's the shortest curve. And you know, this piece here could be as big a volume you want or uh, as small. Um, at the high end, there is an implicit. There is a the only relationship in general between the injectivity radius and the volume is that um, if your injectivity radius is at least you know, is some particular number, then about every point you get this nice embedded ball of radius, uh, injectivity radius of m. So in particular, that implies that the volume of your manifold is at least the volume of that ball. Um, and that does give you a relationship but since the volume of balls in hyperbolic space grows exponentially in the radius, the relationship you get is that uh, the injectivity radius of the manifold is bounded above by some constant times the logarithm of the volume. Um, and if you were to do something like take towers of covers and try to unwind congruence covers, things like this, then you can actually make this type of relationship with some constant. But yeah, in general, you should think of these as being kind of independent of one another. Other questions? Okay, so in the uh, last 10 minutes, um, what I'd like to do is just give you one idea that's behind um, this inequality here. And that is, uh, and to do that, I'm going to actually introduce, uh, maybe I'll just raise this, uh, one more norm maybe two more norms, depending on your point of view. Your extra bonus norms are coming to the first seminar of the semester. Um, and that is, so the Thurston norm, right, was defined by looking at the topologically simplest surface in a particular homology class. But instead, we can look at the geometrically simplest surface. Um, and well, what's the geometric complexity of a surface? It's just its, just its area. Right, so we could say, okay, so given some integral cohomology class, let me define the least area norm of this class. I'm going to note it like this: least area, um, just to be the uh, infimum over the area of a surface which is dual to that class. Uh, now it turns out uh, by results in geometric measure theory that this is actually uh, an equal, this, this infimum is actually achieved. So there is some nice, smooth, minimal surface which represents this homology class of absolute least area. Um, it turns out, though, this, this norm, uh, you can actually think of it in, in another way. So this sort of is in, in analogy to the Thurston norm, right? except we're minimizing areas as opposed to genus. Um, you could also, in analogy to def looking at the L2 norm and talking about harmonic forms, you could sort of you could define what I'll call the L1 norm of a cohomology class, which is just going to be the infimum of the L1 norm. So alpha is just some form representing this, where, oh, uh, what's the L1 norm of a form? Well, it's just the integral over the manifold of the norm of the form at each point integrated with respect to volume. All right, when we're talking about the L2 norm, I was integrating the square of this, and then, of course, I was taking the square root. So that's a perfectly reasonable definition. Um, whereas this thing is actually achieved, uh, this thing here is not typically achieved. 
um, that at least, I mean, I think you could make it if you're willing to work with some kind of distributional. Um, so yeah, there's two things. This is a lemma that comes out of something called the co-area formula uh, in geometric measure theory. It's not hard. So we now have this new norm, which exhibits uh, behaviors analogous to, on the one hand, the Thurston norm, except now it's geometric, um, and on the other hand, the L2 norm, except you're just using a different norm on forms. Uh, and it turns out, though, that it's actually a lot closer to the Thurston norm uh, than it is to the harmonic norm. So in particular, it turns out not to be very hard to show, uh, that for all hyperbolic manifolds, you have that the uh, least area norm is bounded above by 2 pi times the Euler characteristic, sorry, 2 pi times the Thurston norm, uh, and bounded below by uh, pi. So up to this factor of 2, uh, the least area norm is just a rescaled version of the Thurston norm. Um, this comes about because, uh, see the point is, you have this minimal surface representing your homology class, the, the thing that realizes the least area surface. And a minimal surface, its intrinsic curvature is always um, at least as negative as that of the ambient manifold, right? So you have your ambient manifold has curvature minus one, so this surface has curvature bounded above by minus one. And so if you think about what gauss bonnet tells you about the area of that surface, that tells you this inequality. Um, the second inequality, though, is, comes from the fact that, and really I should attribute this, this is um, sort of work of uh, Shane, or in this uh, form, Uhlenbeck, Um, our minimal surface, because it represents a homology class, it's not an arbitrary minimal surface, but it's actually stable. So minimal just means that you're uh, a critical point of the area function. But this thing, because it's the least area, it's actually a global minimum. Um, and that turns out to me allow you to, that what Shane shows is that means there's a uniform lower bound on the curvature of this surface as well. So there's an upper bound, because any minimal surface does, but there's also a lower bound that comes from the stability. Um, and then Uhlenbeck translates that uh, into um, a bound on the area. So that's a, a lemma. Um, and then to conclude, let me just sketch the proof of the inequality that I circled. Assuming, of course, all these various lemmas and claims. So, um, okay, so let's uh, take, we have some cohomology class uh, phi. So let's take alpha, alpha be the harmonic representative of some class phi. Um, I want to relate the Thurston norm to the L2 norm. So uh, we know that the L2 norm of phi, um, sorry. You know the least area norm of phi is bounded below by pi times the Thurston norm. That's our, our lemma here. And um, the least area norm I asserted was the same as this L1 norm, which is infimum over all representatives of their L1 norms. Well, I have here a representative. That's not going to be the minimal one. In fact, the minimal one, there usually is not a minimal one, but it is a representative. So I'm entitled to say, hey, that's bounded above by, by this. Um, and so, I mean, what is, again, what is the L1 norm? It's just the integral over the manifold of the pointwise norm of alpha. Integrate with respect to volume. Of course, I could write this as the integral of the pointwise norm times the constant function 1. Um, and so now this looks like I'm taking an inner product 
the L2 inner product of this function and this function. So by Cauchy-Schwarz, this is going to be less than the L2 norm of both of these guys. Uh, this is, by definition, this is the L2 norm of phi. Um, and the integral of 1, the L2 norm of that, is the square root of the volume. Um, so if you divide this over the other side, you get the rand inequality. So the, the moral, and I will stop, is that to, in, to mediate between and the Thurston norm in the end is sort of fundamentally an L1 thing. I think that's the, what you should think, especially if you think about how it's related to the Gromov norm. This is an L2 thing. Um, so anyway, what you do is you introduce this third norm, um, which sort of mediates between these two things. And once you have that in place, uh, that inequality is just Cauchy Schwartz. So, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Yes. You didn't quantify all over all hyperbolic things when you when you described that situation. You said, well, for this class, this is really. Well, yes, but I mean, because because typically there is some gap between these things. So if you do it over all. So, 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 I mean, right, so if you quantify over, you cannot do, for example, you cannot do significantly better than this. You could change this pi is probably not optimal, but in, other than making this a bigger number, uh, you cannot get rid of this inequality if you quantify over all manifolds. Um, this one, if your injectivity radius is bounded below, then you can't improve this. If your injectivity radius is allowed to go to zero, then you should be able to improve this. I don't know how. Yes? Oh, um, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, so I think um, in the finite volume setting, uh, I mean, you still can. And this is what number theorists always do, is they always like to think of their cohomology as represented by harmonic forms. But um, I think uh, when you have ones that are sort of non-trivial at the cusp, I don't think they're in L2 anymore, actually. So there is not, yeah, because of that. There is on the so-called cusp forms, but not on 